We've all heard that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, so why not get your day off to a healthy start? On today's show, I'll share three wholesome recipes that will encourage you to never skip breakfast again. Irish style brown bread, whole wheat popovers, and whole wheat date nut bread. All today on Martha Bakes. Daniel Horan and I have something in common. We both love buttermilk. It's always been a staple in my refrigerator and it should be in yours too. Don't you agree, Daniel? I do indeed. Now why? Why do you think we love it so much? I think there's something simply delicious about it. Simple and it's delicious. Well, my mother served it to us all the time. We had a dairy in our town and they made very good buttermilk. And the first buttermilk I've tasted since Nutley that I really loved was the buttermilk that I got of yours. I love to hear that. Yeah. My grandfather used to drink it as well. Yeah, so. and we ate it over boiled potatoes with fresh dill and, and mm. sauteed onions. It's great. My favorite soup to till this day. And um, we use it in all our baking. And I, I drink it like a snack. Yeah, it's just so, it's so versatile, and I think well, why is it so good, and and what, why is it good for you? Well, it's uh, it's got all the good is protein. Your, is th that this your, is ours, yeah. Oh, Should we, we pour a little? Yep. Yeah. Oh, nice and thick, Absolutely. creamy. Absolutely. Mm. Cheers. Join you. Cheers. <laughs> What's it made out of? So. We start with whole milk. A lot of people start with fat-free, or if you're making it in the very old style, the whey liquid after butter. But we start with whole milk because there's so much more complexity in whole milk. And in the flavor. Right? And in the flavor. And unlike most whole milks, which are only 3.25% buttermilk, we do 3.8 to 4.0. So it's really rich and rich. creamy. Yeah. And that's what makes it so nice and thick. And that's what makes it so, and such a great performer right. in the kitchen too. Um, and then, you culture it and you, you you heat it up a little bit, you culture it and you let it sit. Letting it sit is really important so it it, uh, it sets and then uh, it's ready to go. Last is it in big days. vats? I mean, when you say culture it, it's cultured yeah, in yeah, big vats? Yeah, it's, it's cultured and then it's it's processed and, and, and we bottle it in quarts and uh, it has to sit so it won't break and then, and then we release it. Wow. How has it changed over the years, buttermilk production? Well, I think really just the onset of refrigeration. Uh, if you think just going all the way back, people had milk. What do we do with it? We can drink it, but now we have to somehow figure out a way to save preserve it, it right. and save it. And so souring milk turned out to be a way uh, to keep it. So make it into buttermilk, into sour cream. So buttermilk, sour cream, and cheese. And ultimately cheese, Kefir. Right. You know, there, are, there are a lot of great right. uses. And how good is buttermilk for you, would you say? Buttermilk is very good for you. It's also very good for your digestion, particularly because the, the cultures start to break down the lactose. So it's, it is a very good digester, but then it has all the proteins, all the... the so is it like a probiotic? And Yeah, I mean, you can't officially call it a probiotic, but it, there are active cultures, for sure. Yeah, I think that's why I like it so much. And it doesn't seem to react in my body like I'm just drinking a plain old glass of milk. Right. I, right. I think I feel better after I drink buttermilk. Well, I think the cultures are working there yeah. for you, which is great. And so what makes buttermilk so great in baking? Well, I think it's just such a good worker bee. Uh, it's, it, it plays well with others. So if, you, if, you, if you're baking with it, it helps the baking soda really react and it makes things fluffy. It's a great emulsifier. Oh, it so, does, yeah, right. So it keeps things together. Yeah, coffee cakes. It's, coffee it acts cakes. like sour cream does, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah so. And what about calories? How? So calories, it's going to be like milk or, or yogurt, okay. so a whole milk. But I think, I mean, I'm, I'm a little more prejudiced on this side. I think the full fat milk is really good for you. I think there's a complexity there that's good for your body. I think it tastes awfully good. And um, another thing that I've learned how to make from this is sort of like sherbet. It dissolves some sugar in it and freeze it uh, in an ice cream maker. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes the best, smoothest, delicious yeah. sherbet. Yeah, we have a bunch of customers that make a buttermilk ice cream. Yeah. Sherbet, absolutely delicious. So is this uh, interchangeable with regular milk and baking, do you think? So not? I, probably not. I think that the acidity is something that's very important that buttermilk brings to the table. So you'd, you'd have to add a little vinegar, um, something to acidify the milk. And what's in this buttermilk? Besides it's, milk. It's very simple. It's milk and culture. That's it. That's it. That's it. Nothing and else. Nothing no else. Preservatives no nothing. preservatives. No, in fact, it, if it works right, it doesn't need preservatives. It gives you an extra maybe 50, yeah. 60 days. And what do you bake with it? Well, I think my favorite is uh, is pancakes. My children love that. Um, I love it straight. Uh, you know, Irish soda bread, it's very good in that. So uh, 
it's, it's a very good all-purpose player in baking. Well, I hope that those of you out there who have not tried buttermilk uh, to drink or to use in baking should definitely do so. And uh, I think you'll be turned into an aficionado if you just give it a try and try it in the next time that you bake also. Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited to have you on the show and learn about uh, all the wonderful things that you make. And uh, thank you. good luck. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. In Ireland, brown bread is at the heart of every meal. Traditionally made with whole wheat flour, this simple crusty quick bread gets a small update with the addition of rye flour. And when the dough is cut into wedges that are baked close together, it forms a loaf that's easy to pull apart. Very easy to make. And you can make it, really just make sure you have fresh wheat and fresh rye flours on hand. So two and a half cups of whole wheat flour, freshly milled if possible. And more and more we're able to find beautiful fresh milled flours. Make friends with your local grist mill and one and a half cups of rye flour, which is lighter, fluffier than the whole wheat. To this, add one and a half teaspoons of salt. And one and a quarter teaspoons of baking soda. You need that baking soda with the buttermilk. Now the only other thing that we add is two cups of the best buttermilk that you can find. No rising time needed. This bread lends itself to numerous creative variations. You could have yogurt in it. You could have currants. You could have caraway seeds. You could have, I'm trying to think of other things that I've added. Oh, herbs. You could have chopped dried fruit, seeds, nuts. So add your buttermilk and stir it until it forms a nice rough dough. The rye flour contains less gluten than all-purpose flour or whole wheat flour. For that reason, it won't produce a well-risen loaf of bread without the addition of some higher protein flour. That's why we're using whole wheat also. But you'll like the taste, and I think you'll love the texture. And if you find that the dough is really, really dry, just add up to a quarter cup more buttermilk. So when you feel that the dough is ready to pick up with your hands, you can sort of push it around in the bowl. It's a little bit of extra mixing. And then put it on a parchment lined baking sheet and form it into a, about a six inch round. It looks so good. So now, once you have it formed into this mound, just cut it with a pastry cutter into six equal wedges. And put into a preheated oven. Bakes just like this. And then you'll be able to pull those wedges apart. The oven should be preheated to 425 degrees. And uh, halfway through the process of about 35 minutes of baking, uh, just turn the tray and let it continue to finish baking. Set your timer. So serve your bread at room temperature or warm. And I love it with smoked salmon and creme fraiche, or smoked salmon and cream cheese. You can break the bread, but if you're going to serve it a little bit more formally, you can cut it into wedges. Look how pretty that bread is, so dense and so beautiful. Now to serve it with the salmon, you can cut this in half this way. Like 
like that and let people help themselves. Whether served with salmon like this or slathered with Irish butter, it's hard to imagine something so good having just six ingredients. Enjoy. Made with a combination of all-purpose flour and whole wheat flour, the batter for these pleasantly sturdy popovers can be made in advance, making them the perfect weekend treat to share with your family and friends. Whether you serve them alongside eggs or topped with butter and your favorite jam, you're all going to love this version of popovers. Three quarters of a cup of all-purpose flour, sifted with three quarters of a cup of whole wheat flour, that's one, two, three quarters, and one and a quarter teaspoons of salt. So mix it together. Very easy. I think there's five ingredients if you count the two different flours and the salt. So it's milk, eggs, flour, salt. And, oh, by the way, preheat your oven to 450 degrees and have your popover pan heating in the oven while you prepare your popovers. Three large eggs, beat those up with one and a half cups of whole milk. In Maine, popovers seems to be the traditional treat in Mount Desert Island and they're made late in the afternoon for tea. People come to my house all the time just for popovers and tea or cappuccino. And you have to have a lot of homemade strawberry, raspberry, or kiwi jam on hand to serve with those popovers. And I can't wait to serve this version with whole wheat flour. And it's very important when you're baking popovers, when you're making the batter, to have everything at room temperature. Don't start with ice cold eggs and ice cold milk. Make sure everything is room temperature. And then this can be mixed with the flour a little at a time. The popover is an American version of Yorkshire pudding. You know, the pudding that's cooked in the fat of the big standing rib roast at Christmas time. The first cookbook to print a recipe for popovers was M.N. Henderson Practical Cooking, 1876. So that's our batter, so easy. And so now, get your popover pans out of the oven. There's usually six to a rack. Now these should be brushed with a flavorless oil for easy extrication of the popovers. And then each little pan will take about a half a cup of batter. Now remember, these are very hot, so they've already started to cook. And if you want to make a lot of these at a time, I would suggest making the batter in batches in different bowls. Unlike muffin tins, popover pans have an open design which promotes even air circulation and heat all around the tins. Most are also made from heavy steel or cast aluminum coated with a nonstick surface. And their deep, steep-sided wells are key to forcing and producing tall, airy rolls with a full cap that pops up high above each cup. If you love popovers as much as I do, you'll want to get a real popover pan like this one. And these tins are really only useful for making popovers, but they make beautiful popovers. And I have the rack on some parchment paper just for easier cleanup. If you can save yourself the chore of washing all these pans, scrubbing them, burnt on batter and stuff, it really does save a lot of time. And parchment paper is inexpensive and very useful. So there, get this right into your 450 degree oven 
and uh, put this in the lower third, bake for 20 minutes. And now set your timer, reduce the oven temperature at the end of 20 minutes to 350 degrees, and continue baking until the popovers are golden brown, dry to the touch, about 20 minutes more. So altogether, about 40 minutes. Don't open the oven as they bake. So now, when they have popped just like this, pull them out of the pans, and I like to just make a little slit right in the side, just to release any excess air and, uh, and to keep the moisture from forming on the inside. So just like that, it's good. Now, don't those look superb? They are ready to eat. Let them cool just a little bit so you can handle them. And then what I like to do is just take one, and let's see what it looks like inside. Very nice cavity, wouldn't you say? And slather with some lovely creamery butter which will melt even further. So here's where you add the fat. Remember, we didn't have any fat in the batter. And I like it with apricot jam. A lot of apricot jam. And just sit down with your cappuccino and your popover. With a well-mixed batter, a hot oven, and a preheated pan, you're well on your way to popover perfection can't wait to eat it. Enjoy. Turn any day into a special day with a wholesome breakfast of whole wheat date nut quick bread with a lovely topping of tangy cream cheese. Dates are the secret ingredient, adding sweetness and moisture. Plus, you may not realize that they are higher in potassium than bananas, and they're also fat-free and sodium-free. So start with your dates. One cup of dates that are pitted and then coarsely chopped. What I'm doing is just kind of slicing the dates first and then cutting them crosswise into approximately a quarter inch dice. Takes a little bit of work and put these into one and a half cups of hot water. This will be our liquid. And it's nice to have pieces that are still identifiable so don't chop in a food processor. You'll get more of a paste if you do that. I remember loving date nut bread as a child. My mother made some very good date nut bread, usually in conjunction with a baked bean supper, the Boston baked beans and the date nut bread. But nowadays, um, you don't have to have the baked beans to enjoy the beautiful dark brown bread with dates and we're gonna use pecans. So let that soak, it looks very good. Your dry ingredients, one cup of all-purpose flour, three quarters of a teaspoon of salt, some baking soda, one teaspoon for leavening. Add your sugar, one and three quarters of a cup of packed dark brown sugar. And make sure you pack it. And light brown sugar, dark brown sugar should be packed like this for accurate measurement. And add your beautiful whole wheat flour, one cup That to your dry ingredients. And notice I have the pan, a loaf pan, already prepared, brushed with a flavorless oil, lined with a sheet of parchment paper and then oil again. And the parchment paper only has to be the widest part of the pan and a little overhang so easy pulling the bread out once it's baked. Okay, and now, you can add one egg. I'm going to break the egg up before I add it to the... And by the way, the dates really take a little bit longer than this, so I already have a swap out. 
Here's our swap out. We can just beat the egg up a little bit with the whisk. And add that to the dates and date water. Add one teaspoon of the best vanilla. And two tablespoons of safflower oil. This will help make the whole mixture nice and moist. There's a lot of history surrounding date nut bread according to the American Century Cookbook. The first recipes for this date nut bread began to appear in the 1920s. And it was so popular in the 1930s that it was used to make tea sandwiches. Two thin slices of date nut bread sandwiched together with a layer of cream cheese or butter and then cut into decorative shapes. The sandwich was a daily fixture of New York City life, particularly for those people on a budget. But it was uh, very delicious. And just add your wet to your dry. And all the lumpies. And your pecans also can be added at last. Stir this well. So nice to have recipes that can be done in a bowl without electricity. And again, you don't want to break up your dates any more than they are chopped and your pecans, uh, one cup of pecan halves that have been lightly toasted and coarsely chopped. And they smell very good. So that's it, that's your batter. At this time, preheat your oven to 350 degrees. And this batter can be spooned right into the pan. I remember many of the early recipes call for baking this bread in buttered and parchment lined or brown paper lined used coffee cans. And when it slides out of the coffee can, it has those nice ridges on it. So get this right into your 350 degree oven and bake until a tester inserted in the center of the loaf comes out clean. 65 minutes, set your timer. So once your bread is baked, let it cool in the pan on a wire rack for about 20 minutes. Turn it out and let it cool completely. If this is well wrapped, it will stay at room temperature for up to three days. And in the refrigerator, even longer than that. And to serve, slice, oh, about a quarter of an inch thick. You can see the beautiful texture inside. Use a serrated knife to slice. Serve like that with a little bit of good cream cheese on top. This is another take on an old-fashioned favorite, a healthier take. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. So buttermilk, you might bake with it, but how about drinking it? I'm just gonna show you a few quick things that I love to do. First is maple syrup, just a little drop. Stir it up, totally good. Here's a little unusual salt and pepper, awesome. And if you have a little time, take your berries, in the glass or in your buttermilk. It's like a quick milkshake, incredibly refreshing.